John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah glory, glory, Welcome to hallelujah. War of the Rebellion Stories of the Civil War, I am your host, Leon, and this is a reading of the regimental history under the Maltese Cross, Antietam to Appomattox, the Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania, 1861 to 1865, Campaign's 155th Pennsylvania Regiment, narrated by the rank and file, and we're picking up at In the Ranks of Company D, by Private William J. Scott. The Macaulay Guards was the name under which Company D of the 155th Pennsylvania Volunteers was recruited in August 1862 in the city of Pittsburgh to serve for three years. Its promoter and financial contributor to its organization expenses was James Macaulay, a public-spirited and loyal citizen of the 4th Ward, Pittsburgh, at that date serving as president of one branch of city councils also engaged in banking business. Captain James J. Hall, who had served in the British Army in the Crimean War, had advertised for volunteers to form a company. Samuel Kilgore, who had commanded a local home guard company, was also advertising for recruits. Alexander Carson of Allegheny assisting him. Captain Hall, for the captaincy, transferred his recruits to Messrs. Kilgore, and Carson. The expenses of recruiting, which were upwards of $25 per day for the drum and fife corps and flag and hull hire, with additional costs of maintaining the recruits until sent to rendezvous at Camp Howe, were all defrayed by Mr. McAuley. He also gave the officers orders on the best tailors in the city for regulation uniforms and belts, and also to manufacturers of equipment for swords and pistols. Captain Hall was unable to endure the forced marches in the field and resigned before participating in active campaigning. Captain Samuel Kilgore became his successor, and Alexander Carson was made first lieutenant, James Well being promoted from orderly sergeant to second lieutenant. The rank and file of Company D, if not recruited from the four quarters of the globe, was gathered from the four quarters of Allegheny County, with considerable drafts upon England, Ireland and Scotland, and the German Empire. Ireland, although in a respectable minority, predominated in the manner of securing all the commissioned officers. It is but proper also to remark that they, Captain Kilgore, Lieutenant Carson, and James Wells, continued to fill said positions with credit, Lieutenant Wells resigning, however, after two years' active service. His place was taken by the promotion of John C. Sweeney, orderly sergeant, like all the companies so hastily recruited at the crisis of the war existing in 1862, Company D had the greatest variety of characters, good, bad, and indifferent. Discipline at first set hard upon the stirring spirits, many being mere boys. Yet in the real duties of a soldier, in fighting, in battle or on skirmish line, scouting or picket duty, they would take any risks. It can truly be asserted, that to a man no better or braver soldiers ever responded more quickly to the hazards of a soldier's life than did the men composing Company D, and was only in the long, dreary, dull, and active days in camp that the devil got busy in a number of Company D. Then it was that commotions and disturbances broke out, terminating in altercations, mutinies, and open rebellion against some particular commissioned or non-commissioned officer. When it did break out, for a while, pandemonium prevailed. In the early days of the service, the members of the company were often known to display their superabundant spirits in camp. After payday, when flush financially and enabled to secure commissary beverages, they were known to capture a newly commissioned officer, and despite his protests and rank, thoroughly to haze him after taking his sword from him. The form of this ceremony at this period often took the shape of a sportively tossing the newly-fledged officer up and down in an outstretched army blanket until he promised to be good and appealed for relief. 
This hilarious disposition on the part of Company D, which might be construed as somewhat subversive of discipline, surprising to state, often called for the severest criticism from officers of other companies in the regiment. Several officers became so indiscreet as openly to boast of what they would do as officers with Company D if Colonel Pearson, commanding the regiment, made them officer of the day, declaring how they would tame the turbulent tigers. Company D soon heard of these threats, and at once began preparation for the coming conflict. Colonel Pearson, commanding the regiment at Warrington Junction, arranged that Captain Kilgore should be detailed on picket duty on a certain day, when one of the belligerent officers, anxious to tame Company D, should be detailed as officer of the day in the camp of the 155th, with instructions to keep the strictest military surveillance over Company D in the absence of Captain Kilgore on picket duty. The officer of the day appeared on duty with a proverbial chip on his shoulder. He was further equipped in regulation uniform, belt, sash, and sword, together with an extra pompous strut. He first ventured to conduct an inspection of Company D. All of the company were on the alert and waiting for the officer in question. The ball opened by a corporal, who had not finished his payday spree, leaving his quarters and passing the August officer without giving him a military salute as the officer of the day. The latter halted the jovial corporal, and in terms very offensive rebuked the offending subaltern, who in profane and unmilitary language promptly retorted. The officer then drew his sword to strike the corporal, who, however, dodged the blow and clenched holds with the officer, throwing him to the ground and taking his sword from him. The disarmed and discomfited officer of the day reported the situation to Colonel Pearson, who at once relieved the disarmed officer of the day. He detailed in his place a new captain for that duty. This officer, uncautiously visiting the outskirts of Company D with a guard to arrest the corporal who had initiated the row, found the whole company all in line, fully armed, and announcing the establishment of a deadline across which the officer of the day was forbidden to step. At dusk, Captain Kilgore opportunely returned to camp, and order in Company D was at once restored. All of Company D always obeyed, with affectionate promptness, any order Captain Kilgore had to give. For form's sake, the corporal and companions engaged in this day's mischief were ordered by Colonel Pearson to be tried for unmilitary conduct, but owing to some error or mistake as to the date of the alleged offense, which had crept into the record, all the accused were discharged. No repetition of the scene ever occurred. The offending corporal had, at Fredericksburg and Gettysburg, distinguished himself with the colors in battle, and was a favorite of Captain Kilgore and Colonel Pearson. In the first battle of the regiment, being the charge at Mary's Heights, Company D claims that Private Philip Linderman, one of its members, who was wounded in the assault, and who remained twelve hours on the field before being removed, went closer to the famous stone wall than any other soldier engaged in the attack on the heights. General Burnside, after the battle, sent a flag to General Lee, asking for an armistice to bury the dead and to remove the wounded on the battlefield, which request was granted. Colonel E. J. Allen, commanding the 155th Regiment, detailed Lieutenant Alex Carson to visit the battlefield, and to recover the bodies of the dead and wounded of the 155th lying between the lines of the contending armies. The bodies of the dead and wounded were placed in ambulances. Lieutenant Carson officially reported to Colonel Allen, as having discharged the duty assigned to him, and that he found Private Philip Linderman of Company D, who had been wounded in the charge the day before lying closer to the famous stone wall than that of any other soldier on that portion of Mary's Heights. The sights and scenes of this visit and detail Lieutenant Carson avers as never being equaled in any later battles during the war. Finnegan finds and loses a fortune. An amusing episode, occurring after the withdrawal of the 155th Regiment from Mary's Heights, to bivouac on the streets of Fredericksburg is narrated by Lieutenant Carson. It concerns Private James Finnegan, a character of Company D. Finnegan was a diminutive little fellow, a typical Irishman, shrewd, witty, and a good soldier. He left a wife and family in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, on enlisting. He was ever eager, by tailoring, barbering, or washing clothes when off-duty, in camp to earn a dollar for the support of his wife and family. He invariably 
drew the government clothes and shoes several sizes too large for him. No amount of drilling could make him familiar with the manual of arms, and no amount of inspections or punishments could make Finnegan look in the least like a soldier. At Fredericksburg, Lieutenant Carson relates that Finnegan, with others, visited an abandoned bank office, and on ransacking drawers found packages of old promissory notes long previously cancelled. Finnegan, unable to read, sought the aid of a comrade, who seriously informed him that his find amounted to one hundred thousand dollars, and that the notes were as good as gold. Finnegan lost no time in confiding his good luck to Lieutenant Carson, and solemnly proposed that they both take French leave for Ireland, where he would divide his fortune equally with the lieutenant. It took great efforts to eradicate from the mind of Finnegan the ideas and visions of great wealth he had acquired. Sergeant William Shore, of Company D, was promoted to be Sergeant Major of the Regiment. The second year of his service, he continued in that important position until the end of his term, rendering most efficient service as a brave and capable soldier. At Appomattox, where the 155th Regiment was on the firing line until ordered by General Griffin, commanding the 5th Corps to cease firing, Sergeant Major Shore had the great distinction of receiving Captain Thomas G. Jones, then a young officer, of General Gordon's staff, bearer of the Confederate flag, of truce to General Grant, and of passing the officer with the flag through the line, on to General Chamberlain, who was in command of the division at that point. The youthful staff officer, Captain Jones, is now the Honorable Thomas G. Jones, United States Judge for the District of Alabama, being appointed to that position by President Roosevelt. On the same memorable occasion, Regimental Bugler William Mooney of Company D had the honor to sound the last bugle call of the Union Army to cease firing when Major George M. Laughlin, ADC to General Griffin, commanding the 5th Corps, was dispatched to deliver the message to the 100 and other regiments to cease firing. The general history of the campaigns at Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, Mine Run, Wilderness, Petersburg, down to the Surrender, and the Grand Review at Washington, describes the scenes and events in which Company D participated, and, therefore, repetition here would be superfluous. For individual records of the 150 men who, from time to time, served in the company, the complete and revised roster in the appendix must suffice. It is due the officers who molded the raw material of this company into disciplined soldiers that credit must be given them. Captain Kilgore, because of his proficiency in drilling the Zouaves in the skirmish drill, was much in demand for outpost duty on the firing line. He was beloved by his men, whom he never invited in time of battle to go anywhere he would not lead. He was wounded twice in battle and received a well-merited brevet with rank of major for meritorious conduct in the field. For wounds incapacitating him from service, he resigned the captaincy March 10, 1865. Lieutenant Carson was brave, fearless, and faithful in his position, ever ready for duty in camp or in action. Lieutenant James Wells, a strict disciplinarian, after two years active service in the field, resigned. Orderly Sergeant John C. Sweeney was promoted, on recommendation of Colonel A. L. Pearson, to the position of second lieutenant in place of Lieutenant Wells. On March 30, 1865, he was commissioned captain of the company. No more popular or meritorious officer than Lieutenant Sweeney proved himself to be held commission in the Union Army. A War Diary Entry Corporal Martin V. B. Salade, of Sharpsburg, seems to have been the only one in the company who kept a daily diary. He left a wife and small family at home when he responded to his country's call. No day's entry in the little diary of this faithful soldier fails to mention in affectionate terms his wife and children. The varied characters in the company and their diversity of manners and occupations are also well illustrated by entries in Corporal Salade's daily journal. Thus, March 30, 1863, Camp Humphreys, Company was paid off today. Settlements of settlers' checks adjusted at same time. Company went on a general drunk today. Evening, 8 p.m. Prayer meeting in company conducted by Private Peter Tippins. Private Peter Tippins, mentioned in the diary, was an Englishman, a coal miner by occupation who in the old country had been an evangelist and exhorter. He often conducted prayer meetings in camp, preaching and singing, and temperance missionary work generally. 
and Company D, his pious efforts to reclaim, were successful until an unfortunate payday was reached and occasioned the fall from temperance grace of many of his promising converts. Peter Tippins was as brave and faithful in his military duties as he was consistent and exemplary in his Christian life. Sergeant George Booth, after participating with the company in the Antietam and Fredericksburg campaign, was transferred from the company to the United States Signal Service and continued on that most important service until the close of the war. It was a remarkable coincidence that in 1886, at the dedication of the 155th Regiment's monument, marking the exact position occupied by the regiment in the Battle of Gettysburg on Little Round Top, Sergeant Booth delivered an address to the regiment describing how the Signal Corps on Little Round Top had, just before the opening of the battle, from its signal station, summoned the 5th Corps, in which the 155th was serving, to capture Little Round Top, then about being assaulted by Longstreet's Corps. But reminiscence have no end once memory's door is opened, and hence many well-deserved tributes to the living and the dead must be omitted for want of space. Where all did so well, who can discriminate? Record Enrollment Casualties etc. of Company D. Killed and died of wounds. Sergeant Alexandra Carson died June 28, 1864 of wounds received at Petersburg, Virginia, June 18, 1864. Corporal James Fawcett died May 15, 1864 of wounds received at Laurel Hill, Virginia, May 8, 1864. Corporal Allen Hagen died January 26, 1863, of wounds received at Fredericksburg, Virginia, December 13, 1862. Corporal William Sutton died April 2, 1865, of wounds received at Five Forks, Virginia, April 1, 1865. Private John Baxter died June 24, 1864, of wounds received at Cold Harbor, Virginia, June 4, 1864. Private Andrew H. Morris Died January 20th, 1863, of wounds received at Fredericksburg, Virginia, December 13th, 1862. Private James Murphy. Died May 24th, 1864, of wounds received at Spotsylvania, Virginia, May 12th, 1864. Private Henry Holt, Chancellorsville, Virginia. Missing in action. Private Henry Holt, Chancellorsville, Virginia, May 3rd, 1863. Died of disease. Private John Beatty near Weldon Railroad, Virginia, September 26, 1864. Private James Dawson, Point Lookout, Maryland, January 6, 1863. Private Hiram F. Gilkey, near Falmouth, Virginia, February 13, 1863. Private John Price, at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, November 1, 1862. Private Thomas Reese, near Falmouth, Virginia, December 1, 1862. Private John A. Stewart near Falmouth, Virginia, December 26, 1862. Wounded in Action Sergeant James K. Carson, North Anna River, Virginia, May 25, 1864. Corporal Andrew J. Devine, North Anna River, Virginia, May 25, 1864. Corporal John A. Himes, Dabney's Mills, Virginia, February 6, 1865. Corporal Isaiah Crowenson. Dabney's Mills, Virginia, February 6, 1865. Private William Dumphy, Five Forks, Virginia, May 1, 1865. Private John O'Doherty, Five Forks, Virginia, May 1, 1865. Private John P. Ford, Quaker Road, Virginia, May 30, 1865. Private Edward Hillsden, Spotsylvania, Virginia, May 10, 1864. Private Joseph J. Hillman, Fredericksburg, Virginia, December 13, 1862. Private Martin V. Keppert, Hatcher's Run, Virginia, March 25, 1865. Private Philip Linderman, Fredericksburg, Virginia, December 13, 1862. Private James Martin, Gravelly Run, Virginia, March 31, 1865. Private James McFadden, Petersburg, Virginia, June 18, 1864. Private Hanford R. Sharp, Spotsylvania, Virginia, May 10, 1864. Private John B. Wilson, Dabney's Mills, Virginia, February 6th, 1865. Private William Whipkey, Bethesda Church, Virginia, June 4th, 1864. Recapitulation. Total enrollment, 139. Killed and died of wounds, 8. Died of disease, 6. Discharged on account of wounds and disabilities, 
38. Transferred to Veteran Reserve Corps, 10. Transferred to other organizations, 23. Transferred to United States Navy, 2. Deserted, 7. Dropped from rules, 2. Discharged on expiration of term, 3. Mustered out with regiment, 39. Never joined company, 1 killed, 2. Wounded in action, 16. All right, everyone. That is for Company D. Sounds like Company D got away with a lot because they were well liked <laughs> by the colonel. All right. With that, everyone, hope you enjoyed another episode. Just punching right through them. They are a lot of work to do, though. The reading's not so hard, but the editing takes me a while. But be moving right along. I'll have a Patreon episode coming out tomorrow which is following the detailed company history of Company F. So it's only a dollar if you want to support the podcast. <laughs> of course, there's also the merch, and I have a PayPal if you would like to donate, which some of you have been very kind. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it and your support with merch. I will go ahead. I have all my merch together finally. I'm going to post pictures on the website of a mug, some stickers, a shirt, a sweatshirt. And a mask, because if you're like me, the missus still wants you to wear a mask, and you just say, fine, okay. But now I get to do it with my own logo on it while I'm doing it, while I'm out in public, so people can ask me what it is. Which, you know, nobody has done, because nobody cares. <laughs> but I care. All right. Take care of yourself. I, it's been really hot this week. I hope you've all been staying cool and safe. And I'll finally back to being able to upload some of that poetry to YouTube once I get, I think, about 10 poems uploaded up on the YouTube channel. I'll move on to some, maybe, onto some other stories. I have found that it's going to be pretty interesting. All right, friends, I'm taking off. Have a great one. Enjoy your weekend. Sign up for the Patreon. One dollar a month, and you get an additional two episodes. And I feel like it's a really great deal. Of course, there are other tiers. But with that, my friends, I will see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Old John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah For his soul is marching on John Brown was a hero Undaunted, true and brave And Kansas knew his valor When he fought her rights to save And now though the grass grows Green above his grave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah He captured Harper's Ferry with us nineteen men so few And frightened old Virginia till she trembled through and through They hung him for a traitor, themselves a traitorous crew But a soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Marching 
John Brown was John the Baptist of the Christ we are to see. Christ who of the bondman shall the liberator be. And soon throughout the sunny south the slaves shall all be free. For his soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. That he heralded, he looked from heaven to view On the army of the Union With its flag red, white, and blue And heaven shall sing with anthems Or the deed they mean to do For his soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Then strike while strike ye may The death blow of oppression in a better time and way The dawn of old John Brown has brightened in the day And his soul is marching 